and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. <coughs> Coming to us from Hoodwink Games, previously known for the basic and generic RPG as well as Star Set, now venturing into the world of war games with Play Anywhere Now. A Play Every... <laughs> Sorry. New, oh, new, new acronym. PEN. Um, play Easily play. Now. There, I got it. Yeah, you got it. The one and only Josiah Mork. How are you doing today, man? What's doing real well. Better now that I'm here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for com thanks for coming on. So, I feel I feel like I have to take a bit of a victory lap since um I, since when you had when you had initially set this up as just a war game version of basic and generic, and then decided to do a name change. I had I had voted for pen since of the names that you had had um suggested, and I had said I better I better see an expansion called Pen Pals. <laughs> we we haven't settled on that quite yet, although the input was definitely appreciated. Um, we're working on supplements still, and Pen Pals is definitely a fun one, but I feel like we're going to have to do a little uh, uh, audience analysis before we lean into it too hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, j I'm, just, I'm just saying, meme magic is real. Oh, it's true. It's true. The internet does love their memes. But as as I understand it, this is intended to be a um a generic war gaming system that could be used for just about any set any set of minis from any, from any set of games or even ones that aren't associated with games. Yeah, exactly. So I set it up um because, you know, actually literally right next to me on my desk, I have like 3,000 points of Adeptus Mechanicus that are covered in dust because I can never persuade anybody to sift through the changing rules of Warhammer 40k. Um, and frankly, at this point, I'm a little scared to myself. And behind me, I've got Lego sets that are similarly covered in dust. And my miniature, my mini figures are just kind of sitting there. And because I, you know, I'm a 23 year old guy, I don't play with Legos that much anymore, but I love collecting them, I love building them. Um, and so when I was, you know, reading up on lore and I've got all these figures that I love collecting and I've got a 3D printer right next to me too that I love pumping out miniatures for, but I don't really have a good reason to because, again, they take up space and I don't have anything to do with them. I was just like, man, there's got to be a way to create a system that is easy to learn so people can be doing stuff, but that's still, like, strategically satisfying, that it's not just kind of a boring throwaway set of, of rules. Um, and that's really what got me started on pen. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I think I may have told you about one of my old armies um, back back in the day that I used to basically basically troll basically troll people. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It was a it was a salamander imperial guard mixture because okay. I decided because I decided I was going to abuse the hell out of one particular model in um the Imperial Guard, that being Usakar E. Creed. Okay. I'm not too familiar with Astro Militarum, so you'll have to to catch me up on him. There's no way you could get away with this nowadays because everybody knows the meme, but he had a he had a rule called Tactical Genius, where any unit that he's that he's attached to is treated as a stealth unit. Mm. Unfortunately because of the way units worked you could you could have him in the same unit that has a Warhound Titan, and now you have a Stealth Titan. Oh my gosh! Did you have a Warhound Titan? Cause that would no, be sick. I had a bunch. I I had a bunch of Land Raiders. I didn't go with the Titan because it was too expensive for what I wanted to do. Oh yeah. Because be, because I knew that some of the other people loved loved fielding loved fielding Warhound Titans or similar heavy armors. So mm. I would get I would get a bunch of um, terminus pattern land raiders. Okay. Where so, the terminus pattern is where somebody said, okay, the the main cannon, those side cannons, take that off. 
and put as many las cannons as we can on a tank. <laughs> like it's 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 got like it's got I think six full size las full size las cannons on it on the <laughs> on the land raider chassis and against against infantry it's against infantry or max you know marine equivalents it's yeah. not that great because it, because it doesn't have as as much um fu as much fire and forget mm. but against armor <laughs> <laughs> guess it worked out all right huh yeah now there is the chance that it can overheat and explode but in order to do that I'd have to roll nothing but ones and the odds of that are like one in fifteen hundred, so I think I'm good. So yeah, I'd you never know. No. Never know. I was once playing Adeptus Custodes, what two up save, rolled five ones, mm -hmm. wiped the unit to Gene Steeler Infantry. I was so mad. I've I've often stated that no matter what your ethnicity, the dice gods hate you. Oh yeah. Oh, kind of fair. The, but the the whole idea was wait for wait for them to start sending the the armor and then um, it met it um mysteriously disappears because of a, <laughs> because of because of surprise six tanks show, showing up and just uh, and just unloading on it because you, know, <laughs> you know everybody's spending all their points on a bunch of their points on that massive unit the distraction carnifex as it's called. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hard to do that when it's um, full of holes. It's facts, totally facts. But a lot of a lot of it was uh, the com the setup was um, was do was do a a whole lot of tarp a whole lot of tar pit tactics, you know a lot a lot mm -hmm. of cheap foes that are just there to eat up time. Mm-hmm. And well, that... it works well with Astro Militarum. Mm-hmm. And keep keep in mind it was Astra Militarum and Salamanders. Yeah, what Ooh. edition was that? I don't remember. Oh, I've been switching it up so many times now. Cause for a while you couldn't even deploy characters as part of a unit, but now in tenth you can again. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking it must have been at least sixth or seventh. And oh, that's back before I was even in it. And rem remember, Salamanders like to do one thing very well: burn. Oh yeah, <laughs> Blamey boys. Mm -hmm. So a good anti infantry. Yeah, yeah, because um, it was it was it was to the point where I called half of the inf I called half of my units um, Flammenwerfer. <laughs> Get the Flammenwerfer, <laughs> the heavy Flammenwerfer. <laughs> <laughs> we mean that all the time playing War Thunder. Oh. Uh, uh, Good stuff. The I haven't played War Thunder in a while, though I've I've played w World of Tanks more f more frequently. Um, occasion occasionally I will do I will do hit and I will do hit and run um, tactics or just do li just do little things to try and annoy people. Mm -hmm. Um, some some of the, some of them involve pl involve playing tag. You know, do doing a little bit of damage here and there, and just have them keep running around in circles trying to find me. Nice. Because oh, it's a good game. Because like. I like to I like to do troll moves in multiplayer. I mean, I am the kind of person who playing Battlefield would set up claymores at the top of ladders. Oh, that's mean. <laughs> Just ruining some poor guy's night. Oh, I mean, I've, I've, I've done, I've done the, I've done that. I've, I've, um, I think, I think on more, on more than, on more than one, on more than one occasion, I got very creative with, um, remote detonators, <laughs> <laughs> especially around, especially around corridors. Somebody thinks that they're safe, that they're safe, and then they get a bad case of explosions. Oof. I don't know. Obviously, that meant I played Demo Man a lot in Two Fort. You know, just all just all the damn sticky bombs, or a, or occasion, 
occasionally use use the um use these sticky launchers to do especially for demo night to do surprise attacks. Ah, uh, yeah, getting some of those booms in there. Mm -hmm. My buddy did that with uh, boom sticks. He just like switch weapons while he was running at somebody, and then they would just both explode. Mm -hmm. But obvious, obviously, when it comes to when it, com when it comes to war gaming, there's di there's different scales of things. You have your more skirmish or large skirmish approaches, like say Infinity, and then you've mm -hmm. got the I have way too much disposable income, like say 40k Apocalypse. I never yeah. played 40k Apocalypse because I don't have that kind of money. Same. Like, have you ever seen one of those Imperator slash class Titans that are used in some of those matches? Yeah, that are basically <laughs> just walking store displays. Oh. They're still gorgeous, though. Don't get me wrong. I still like that's a bucket list item. But uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, where it's, it's the size of a small child. Yup, yup. Oh, and I know that you have the is the where is it a case where what you're doing with pen meant to and meant to accompany both through the point limits? Yeah, yeah. So we do um. There's four different battle formats that it's kind of styled for. Mm -hmm. So you've got two that are definitely styled more towards the smaller um, type of gameplay where you almost have like an unmatched or like a, um, a hill team style, like my two, three guys versus your two, three guys, or even like one character versus one character. Mm -hmm. Those are like the dual formats. And then we have one that's a little bit more. It's so the duel is 100 points. Then the next is 350 points. So you're looking at you know a couple big characters or maybe a big character and like two weaker squads, something like that. And then um, from there it jumps up into 1500 points where you're looking at more of a built out army that you might be fielding like 50 or so miniatures. So this is kind of like a you know what you imagine when you think of a war game. And then it goes up to um, 3,500 or 3,000 or 3,500. I forget which is the largest format, and that's where you're looking at like 150 miniatures. So still not quite the like Warhammer Apocalypse style, although you definitely could build up to that if you wanted to. Um, but you know you're you're looking at a pretty big uh, deployment of of minifigures or miniatures or whatever, and you can really sew a lot of cool tactics and in, in combos into them. Mm -hmm. And with the, now, given the given the fact that this is a gen, a generic rule set, um, how do you how do you um main, how do you maintain that particular point that particular point setup when you when you have when you can use just about anything for army building. Yeah, so it really comes down to the impact of the abilities. Um, I noticed when I was watching Tabletop Tactics, I don't know if you, you've watched any of them, but they do a ton of Warhammer 40k playthroughs. They're just so much fun. I love watching them. Um, I actually had a bunch on today. But, you know, they're playing all the armies, and at nine times, maybe nine and a half times out of ten, the abilities that are being used are just the same buffs of plus one to this roll, minus one to this roll, you know, move a little bit more, whatever, but reskinned with different names and then limited when you can use them to be thematic for the army. And so while I was watching all these videos and then I actually went through profiles too online, I just basically tracked with, okay, what are all of the things that actually happen in a war game? Usually you have weapons that pierce a little bit more, which means the defender's defense goes down a little bit. You have weapons that explode and, you know, do different damage. You have, you know, all these, these different abilities. And I just took paper and pencil and mapped out, okay, what are all of the things that can happen? And then abilities are just things that change that. And so, you know, if you have a weapon that is going to cleave through armor, it could be a claymore or it could be a lightsaber, but it ultimately comes to more or less the same thing. And so having an ability that reflects the impact of it lets you reskin it however you want with whatever miniatures you're using. And it just keeps down the bloat, you know, then you don't need to have... 350 profiles written for 15 different armies you can just 
have the list of 10 pages of, of characteristics that we have, or actually I think it's more like 25, um, that covers just about everything once and then have fun combining those different ways. Mm -hmm. um, the, so with the, with that in mind, I do, I do see that there's kind of a, kind of a um, role system with the unit types. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go. I'd like to go from top to bottom of the of those and get a feel for what would be an equivalent unit in since it, since it's a case where it'd be on the same page. Let's use let's use um forty k for 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 the for the equivalents. Yeah. Um. Character. So a character is going to be uh, in terms of forty k, like your your chaplains, your lieutenants, your um your tech priests, your, um, all of those kind of single, I think even in 40k they call them characters too, mm -hmm. um, but kind of your single miniatures that are like the officers or the linchpins. And then across other fandoms it'd be like Lord of the Rings, it might be your Aragorns and your um, Frodo's or your Anakin's and your Obi-Wan's from Star Wars, something like that. Yeah. Um, squad. Squad's kind of like your meat and potatoes. Those are the guys that are going to be dishing out probably the most damage, probably the biggest board presence. You're gonna there's gonna be you know a nice balance between large number of miniatures. They're a unit that's a squad is five to twenty miniatures um, per unit, so they can claim objectives better, um, fill up the board a little bit better. But then they're also a little bit more survivable. So like in uh, 40k, this would be like your Space Marines. It might be your um, like Drakari witches. It could be your Tau. Um, uh, breachers, something like that, where they're kind of just the, your basic go-to guys. Mm -hmm. um, minions. Minions are kind of your chaff units. So these are the guys that maybe your unit creates for free. There are some abilities that allow you to like resurrect dead units and they'll show up as minions. Or you can perform rituals that summon free units. Um, that would come onto the table as minions. They're really, really weak, but they have a big footprint. They can be 5 to 40 models, so they can really block off your opponent. Um, and they're kind of your nurglings, your grots, your servitors, your conscripted um, infantrymen. Uh, you don't really expect them to do a whole lot other than fill up space, but they have such a quantity of attacks that maybe sometimes they'll get some chip damage into. Mm-hmm. I can, I can I can see that and contraption. Those are just all of your vehicles. So any tanks, any planes, any um, shuttles, transports, drills, uh, all of those are going to be your contraptions. And they don't have like a limited base size. They don't have a, um, a some of the limits that other units have. They're only a single miniature. They can be whatever vehicle you're working with. Um, and they have to be a machine type of unit, so that kind of gives them a particular set of characteristics that they can take to reflect more of the armor, transport, flying capabilities that you might see with a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Or even even something as low as servitors. Would, would you consider something like a servitor a minion or a contraption? Probably a minion contraption, since they're limited to just one miniature. Um, I typically think of them just as like your Terax Pattern Assault Drills, your Rhinos, your uh, Star Weavers, things like that. You definitely could do like, um, if you want to do like General Grievous, who's like a machine cyborg, mm -hmm. you could build him as a, con or as a um, contraption. But because of the way the characteristics are set up, he would probably be more intuitive to build as um, a, a character, it's just that, you know, the system is flexible enough, it can adapt both. It's just kind of the way that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And with each of with each of the categories, it's you have you have kind of a size range, how many models per each per each unit, um, points mm -hmm. per model and num number of skill points. Would mm -hmm. would skill points be akin to spe be um, to the special rules that units can have in other war games? 
Skill points are more like your uh, your base lineup. So if you think of um, 40k, that'd be like your ballistic skill, your leadership, those types of skills. Mm -hmm. um, so your base profile will have just kind of a, um, a default values. Most of the time it's one. And then you spend those skill points to increase them in different ways. So that lets you kind of reflect whether you want your base profile to be more shooty based or more resilient or more melee. And then the special abilities and the other things that you add on are characteristics that increase the army point cost of the model mm -hmm. um, and sometimes will affect your skills as well, but they won't affect those baseline stats as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, and of, now um, with, that in, with that in mind, before I get to the nitty-gritty on, on the die rolling approach... Um, obviously, 40k has its own has its own phase dedicated to psychers. Fantasy had a had a similar thing with uh, ma with magic, and plenty of games have their own dedicated system just for the supernatural effect. Whether it be magic, whether it be psionics, whether it be um, other for other forms of ma magic that are totally miracles, and not <laughs> and not magic at and not magic at all, even though they're not. <laughs> You know, remember, all magic in Warhammer Fantasy is chaos magic, even miracles. Just don't let any of the priests tell you that unless you want to fall down a flight of punches. <laughs> Pretty much. Unless you get, uh, there, there are rumors from the high ups that maybe the Emperor will let you do miracles sometimes, but unless you've reached that status, expect to just get, uh, get axed by your, um, officer. So keep the rumors on the DL. <laughs> mm hmm. So yeah, so with, the with in your case you have powers. So how would that work? Yeah, so with powers you get a set of abilities um based on the characteristics that you choose. So you don't by default get any powers. Everybody's kind of a, a normal air quotes person. Um, but you can choose like Acolyte or Arcanist or whatever. Um, you can even choose to be like a deity or a demigod that will give you certain powers as well. And then it lets you choose a certain number from the list that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll take those and they cover things like force abilities, like pushing or moving terrain around. Um, they cover more like spell casting things like you might see in D&D &D of like fireball and lightning bolt and arcing lightning or even Emperor Palpatine's kind of force lightning abilities. Um, and then you also have things that are more like 40k or more like old world. Um, that's kind of those summoning down storms and opening up, you know, portals and stuff like that. So it operates under the same mechanic where you roll a d6 and you just add your skill to it. So it's none of the over under different tiers of modifiers having to, you just roll a d6 and you add your skill. So it's super straightforward and you roll a d6 for each model in the unit. So if you have a squad of 10 cultists that are trying to cast a thing together, then technically you have 10 chances. Whereas if you're a character, then the skill is probably going to be higher, but you only have the one chance unless you take characteristics that give you kind of um, su supporters. There are ways to add more to it. Um, then you roll the dice, you add your skill, and depending on how powerful the ability is, you have to hit a certain threshold to activate the power or else it fails. So you're just rolling the d6 and adding your skill, but then depending on which powers you've taken, it'll require a different threshold to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can get that, and and maybe maybe down the road allow for something stupid like hand of dust. Is that a D and D spell? No, nope. hand of dust is a spell that oh, that Nagash has. You know, the Skelly Pope. Ah, interesting. And an easy Nagash is um. Well, he's well. He's from the same. He's from the same place that Setra the Imperishable is in. So he is, um, I would divinely arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he's old world. Okay, or he's yeah. Kingmar. And um, over over on over on one d four chan, they have a they have a list of all the bad things that Nagash has done. It's um quite long. <laughs> 
believe it. To the point oh, that man. it reads like a short essay of just all the <laughs> shit he's got, he's done. He also has gotten screwed over by the Skaven three times, because he's so, oh. because he's so much of a bastard that the Skaven were like, you know, what, we're actually gonna work with humans to screw you over. Wow, <laughs> that's a testimony to something. That's a testimony to <laughs> to how how scared of 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 him the Skaven were. They would be willing to work with other people and not stab them in the back. This is a dope mini. I'm gonna have to look into this guy. Yeah, I haven't played Sigmar that much, but man, he's really cool. But Hand of Dust, the idea is you you take one you take one d6, put it in your hand, put put it in one of your hands, put your hands behind your back, and your opponent has to pick which hand has the dice. If he picks the oh. one that does that has the dice, nothing happens. If he picks the one that doesn't, then one of the then one of his one of the minis that the opponent has is no longer there. Oh, and it, does, it doesn't get it doesn't get a save. It's just gone. Oh my gosh, that's so brutal. It's so it's so brutal, but the fact that it involves this princess bride level shit is yeah. so hilarious to me. Because if, if you've seen well, Princess Bride, it's like it's like the which of the which of these cups is poisoned scene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is fun. It's a fun you know alternative use of d sixes. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know our system comes with open license, so yeah. anybody who wanted to come out, if you wanted to come out with the, you know whatever Mimi stuff, you could totally do it and publish mm -hmm. it too. Um, so it'd be yeah. super fun to see just a whole book of kind of those and kind of like the. Uh, Oh, what's the magic card that I'm thinking of? Where if it was you dropped it on the table and anything it touched got destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I forget, like Orb of Destruction or something like that. Yeah, yeah, all of those kind of fun little gimmicks would be really cool. But now, with with that in mind, since since one of the parts of creating a unit is the type, are there certain mechanical benefits that are that are granted to cer to certain types, or is it or is it um more or is it more based on being a descriptor? There are some benefits. Um, so certain characteristics will only be able you can only take if you're a certain type. So like characters are the, the only ones that have access to some of the like bodyguard um, characteristics where you actually can take other units and make those units soak damage before they get to you. Or there are some that are like resurrecting um, characteristics that allow you to bring characters back to back, uh, back to life or summon mm -hmm. minions. And those are limited more to characters just because characters tend to be more powerful but also more fragile. And so it's kind of an internal balancing system. Um, and then you have some that are just for squads or just for minions because they are a bigger presence on the battlefield but also per miniature are weaker. And so it's, again, kind of an internal balancing system where we limit which characteristics are available to which type of units to make sure that they thematically make sense and also that they don't get too broken or out of control. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, use, you're using D6s as the, as the main resolution system. Now, is this a, is this a case where it's, um, it's, a, it's aim high, aim, aim low? How is the standard resolution when it comes to just a basic attack. Yeah, you want to aim high. So you, as long as you roll a seven between your skill and your roll, then you get a succeed. So in the case of an attack, you know, if my clone trooper minifigure is shooting at your battle droid minifigure, and I have an accuracy of three, then that means that I need to roll at least a four in order to get a hit on your battle droid. Um, and then if you get a twelve, then you get double hits. So if I happen to have a six in my skill and roll a six or, you know, I roll a four, but I have a bunch of abilities that stack onto it or whatever, then I could potentially hit even multiple of them um, by rolling that 12. Mm -hmm. So it, so it is, a, it is a case where you're aiming high, but you, you want to get as close to 12 as you can. Yep, the higher the better. So... On the on the, I guess I guess that means that you don't have two charts you're having people look at, um, is and is it a case where, you're where you're rolling d you're rolling d six for, 
um, each in each individual unit, like a like a squad might roll um, might roll one, a squad of five would roll five d six. Yep. Yep, unless there are some characteristics you can take to give them special weapons. So there'd be some cases where, you know, you might have rapid fire on that squad, so each of them would get two dice and you'd be rolling ten. But as a base set, yeah, each one will just roll one d6, yeah. and then you'll roll all of them together for one unit. And when it comes to mid when it comes to mitigating damage against the target, just using the example that mentioned that we mentioned before. Is that is that also rolled, or is that or is that just a static reduction? That's also rolled. Yup. So there are some abilities that give you static reduction. You can take armor that of different variances that will reduce the incoming damage by a certain amount. Um, but you kind of have two options: you can dodge or you can resist. So if you resist, then your whole unit tries to block all of the incoming damage, and every success that you get just reduces the incoming damage by one. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you can dodge, and that's more of a unit or model by model basis where you roll one for each model, and then each of the models that succeeds becomes invulnerable to the incoming damage, and all of the rest of the damage is just dealt amongst any units or models that failed in the unit. Mm -hmm. And then as part of that, if you dodge, you also have to be able to move at least one inch away from the attacking unit uh, to kind of reflect your your guys shifting to avoid the damage. So you can kind of outmaneuver somebody to make sure they can't dodge, but those are the two options that are generally available to mitigate damage is the blocking and the dodging. And you have, as I understand it, eight eight, um, stats. Movement, which is self-explanatory, how much you can move in an action. Um, Mm -hmm. HP, also self-explanatory. This is be the equivalent of wounds. Um, I'm guessing ac- accuracy that is the that that is the modifier to the roller is that what you're trying to roll um it, that's how, the modifier so yeah. what, so you roll so for each of the d6 you're adding say say if an accuracy is 5 you're adding 5 to the roll yep yep um i'm guessing str- so strength would be how would be the base damage strength is the um it's the equivalent of accuracy it's just for melee all right. so accuracy is what you add to all of your shots and then strength is what you add to all of your um melee combats. so this is ballistic skill and weapon skill equivalent pretty much yeah pretty much except uh, instead of trying to roll an over you're trying to roll or you're adding it on mm-hmm. so the f- so um Resistance. That's what that's what you're rolling to resist, as mentioned before. Yep. Uh, would you use that if you're if you're um, attempting to dodge, or would you use something? Would you use something else? You would use agility if you're attempting to dodge. Mm-hmm. Um. So, and that then there's um, Arcana, which is what you're using to. Do, to do spell casting, would magic be treated? Would magic or power use be treated as its own um, phase, or is it something that's on an individual action basis? It's an individual action basis. Yeah. So the game, instead of being kind of like you take your turn and have all of your phases, and then I have mine and do all of my phases, you activate units um, in alternate. So kind of more like Age of Sigmar, where one goes at a time. And then when the unit activates, it gets um, a certain number. I think it's three actions where you can choose what, how you want to spend them. So you can do attacks, you can do extra movements, you can do uh, spell casting abilities. There are certain characteristics that will give you unique abilities. Um, you can do shots, you know, however you want to do that. And you can do them in any order. And then once you've done all that you want to or you've done all of those actions, then it just is done and it moves to the next player. Mm-hmm. I can, I can get I can get that cuz some ga- some games will have it that you're moving that you're moving everything in certain phases, you know, the you should be familiar with this, the charging phase, the shooting phase, all all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And some yep. of them go on an individual basis. Mhm. 
Yeah, it's the phases are somewhat helpful for structure, and when you have a much bigger body of rules that are tinkering with things in different ways, it can help to have that structure, but it also just adds so much complexity that I would prefer, and the tactical options are just more fun, in my opinion, of having the choice of whether you're going to do things in a different order, um, that it just seemed both simpler and more fun to just break it down to that level. Mm-hmm. Um, and the since since our, since magic is well rolled, I don't I don't think you're gonna be you're gonna be doing any situation where there where um you have where you have some sort of limited you have some sort of limited resource some sort of MP equivalent or the spell charge equivalent or even the um random the random spell use th thing that that you've <laughs> seen that you've seen in both fantasy and 40k. Mm hmm. Nope, it's it's all constant. So you get to choose your spells ahead of time. You always will have the option to cast them on your turn, and it'll always be resolved the same as any of the other skills. You'll just roll your d6 for each model, and you'll add your skill to it. The only difference being, depending on which uh, spell or power you choose, um, you'll have to roll a different result. It won't necessarily be a 7. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Um, now, since since um, vigor is listed as the ability to resist fear and supernatural effects, would th would this mean would um would this include s straight up attack magic like say firing a bolt of lightning? Would that be resist? Would that go under resistance or would that go under vigor in terms of what it's contested against? It depends on the spell. So some spells won't even offer a save at all. It's just if it succeeds, you just take a chunk of damage, kind of like um, Smite in 40k or, or um, Old World. Um, but some will have more kind of secondary effects, so like uh, make a vigor roll, and then if you fail, then something bad happens, kind of like a D&D &D, um, skill save sort of deal. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes if there's a non-damage effect... So there are some that let you like move an opponent's unit, like mind control, or you can um, make them flee a certain amount or make them attack another unit, something like that. Those are all kind of the effects that you would resist with Vigor. So Vigor is not as much a resisting damage type of thing. It's mostly a resisting those secondary effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. And one one thing that I notice that I find interesting is that you're in the steps that are listed. You're rolling to hit, then you're determining damage, and then the opponent gets the gets the opportunity to block or dodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it it works out where your um your weapons will almost always do a consistent amount of damage. Um, it's pretty much always one, although there's a couple artifacts and like special abilities that increase that number. Um, but it'll always be the same amount, so you don't have to like roll extra for it. And the attacker doesn't have to roll again after they hit to see if they wound. That step's just cut out if you're uh, coming from 40k. Um, so you just roll to hit, and then you know how much damage each hit will be based on the weapon profile. Mm -hmm. And then the defender rolls to either resist or dodge. And if they resist, then they can, you know, they might resist two of the three damage on a three damage hit and then take the last one. Or if they are trying to dodge, then they either dodge all of it or they don't dodge any of it. Um, but the the damage is just kind of a fixed amount that you don't have to worry about rolling for. Mm -hmm. that, cer that certainly makes sense. Now, yeah, it just keeps it a bit cleaner. With, yeah, with that... With that, in, with that in mind, within the full book, do you plan on including at least one example army to kind of showcase um, what f what potential can be taken? Yeah, so it actually comes with two example armies. Um, they're the um, encounters, so they're those 350.1. So they're not huge, but they each come with, I think it's four different units, um, complete with the profiles built out and paper miniatures for them. 
Um, I've tested and printed them out too. I've got them on my shelf here. They're, they're super cute um, and super fun. But it's yeah, it's all baked in right there so you can see what it looks like to have a unit all together, what it looks like for them to kind of have abilities that synergize together. And then you can just print the miniatures out and play right there to get a test for it. And all of that's available in the free demo also. So if people are kind of on the fence, they're not sure how this might feel compared to games they're used to, then you can get a try for that for free too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. And I I well I am aware that you've put up a few um a few dem a few demonstration videos on the Kickstarter page, which is all is always nice to give people guidance. If if you look in, if you look at enough of these streams on this channel, you'll see that guidance is one of those things that I get that I get on certain ga I get on certain game designers a lot about. Mm. Yeah, it's something I'm definitely trying to work on. Video content is, I'll admit, not my strength. I'm a very graphics-heavy guy. Um, but I wanted to be sure to have some demos at least available so people could see what it was like. And then we're actually working on an ongoing series also, and I've got four or five videos up, I think four videos up right now, that just walks through the book conceptually in like five to seven minutes video um, at a time where you can get a sense for each of like the, the mentality behind it, how to set up a game, how to build a unit, what these actions look like, and so on. So if there's a particular area that people are curious about, then there'll be a video explaining that too. Oh. The Now with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? The page count right now is uh, under 60 pages. So, Or actually, it might be like exactly 60 pages because I had to make sure that the, the paper miniatures weren't on double-facing pa uh, pages or else you couldn't cut them out. Yeah. Um, but and... yeah, it's, it's only like 60 pages. So you only have about eight pages of actual rules of learning how to play the game. And then you have like... Um, like 25-ish, 30-ish pages of these characteristic options and powers. And then the rest are those paper miniatures explaining terrain, explaining you know how you build a unit, stuff like that. So it's a really, really lean and mean book. Really easy to use. Mm -hmm. And... I just realized that there's one other aspect I forgot I forgot to ask about, and that per, that pertains to um, stealth. There's mm. always there's often the fantasy of the stealth unit. In some games, it'll, you can deploy them further than the deployment zone and then activate them later on, or reveal them later on. Some have other approaches to the idea of stealth. Um how would you handle it like let's let's say that somebody wants to make the equivalent of a scout marine unit um, mm -hmm. which of course are going are going to have you know things like silent movement or being stealthy or even let's go one step further and say somebody wants to make the katachan jungle fighters in all but name yeah yeah you can totally do that so there are a couple different ways you know so there are those advanced movement options so there are some where you can essentially redeploy them um after you've placed all of your models then you have the uh in reserve ones so there are some where you can take them off the table and put them back on again um there are some where like camouflage is definitely an ability in the game where if they are next to a terrain piece then you can't target them uh, or you, you just get a limit on if you can target them. Um, and then there are some where they have to be like the closest unit in order for them to be targeted. So it gives you a lot of different variations on how you want to flavor it. Um, if you want them to be more of the like scouts where they just move early on, then you can do that and then they're just kind of vulnerable, but they get that advanced speed. Or you can definitely make it more of that they're hard to hit, they're hard to see style uh, penalties. Uh, just how you want to flavor it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can, I could certainly see it. And, and with that in mind, if you, if you don't mind, I'd like to, I like to put things to the test a little bit. Um, before yeah. I go into this, um, how familiar are you with like the original Halo trilogy? Pretty 
familiar. I've never played them, but my roommates explained the lore in depth to me before. So I are, familiar, I think. <laughs> are you familiar enough with like the base wep like 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 the base weapons? Um not by name. I can here I have got my Google ready though, so because mm -hmm. uh, a while back on the Geek Watch podcast, we Explored this idea of of um, creating of creating a war game based around Halo. Okay. And obviously, obviously, the obviously with that we we'd end up we did we didn't use a D six based approach. We used two D ten. We used two D ten. You keep the highest. You get extra mm. effects if you get if you get a match. Um. But let's you. But um, for on the case of units, let let's use the um, let's use some of the units with the UNSC, for instance. Like a um, I've, I'd say I based on the way you've described it, I'd say a marine would be akin to a would obviously be akin to a squad. Yeah. Yep. Um. But where would you put a um, ODST? In? Um, if you're um, not, are, are you familiar with what a ODST is in Halo's universe? I'm not. ODST stands for Orbital Drop Shock Trooper. Okay. They are they are essentially a kind of special ops like like units something. Something akin to paratroopers in in like a World War II army, they okay. tend, they tend to get dropped in into into deep cover and are fo and focused more on behind enemy lines kind of actions. Ah, gotcha. um, Which is why in, in the ODST, um, more glorif glorified expansion for Halo Three. Instead of get it, instead of getting the battle rifle, you get a um, suppressed submachine gun. Interesting. Okay. All right. I'm reading through there as we were talking. I'm reading through just kind of their mm -hmm. wiki page to get a sense for like abilities, themes, purposes, that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. So I'd probably slot them in at a squad, um, and just make them a really high point squad. So you can sink up to um it's 200 or 250 points into a squad in abilities so they start off at uh 10 points per model so you probably take a, a unit of five so that'd be 50 model or 50 points for the five models mm -hmm. and then i would just pump them with like 150 points of different abilities um looking at their their orbital drop in probably do a late deployment um you could take an ability for that or the game also lets you deploy in two waves, so you can do one round of troops and then they can move out of your deployment area and then another round of troops. Mm -hmm. So um, you could do, if you wanted to make them as kind of like a second wave of like tactical reinforcements, you could do something like that. Um, looking at their weapons, you said they use machine guns instead of the normal rifles? Um, sub, keep in mind, submachine gun. Remember, the the sub part refers to the caliber, a sub caliber okay. weapon. S SMGs are you, um, are usually using a smaller sized round than say a rifle round. Okay. And hence the name. Okay, so I would probably give them um, the rapid fire ability, but you can take it in two different degrees. So you can do rapid fire where it just doubles the, your number of attacks. Or you can do what they call, or what I call, I guess, in the game, frantic rapid fire, which means you get double the number of attacks, but they get um, minus one or minus two to them. So it's it costs much fewer points to take them, but then they're um, a little bit weaker of attacks. So if that thematically was what you wanted to do, you could I would take that ability, and then it would give you more if you wanted to buff like their stealth or their deployment options. Yeah, that that brings me to another question: How would you handle range with pen? When it comes to like shooting range for, for well shooting weapons. 
Yeah, so this is probably the most controversial part of the game um, that we've gotten from reviewers and, and feedback, but I like it. Um, there is no li range limitation on weapons, and we actually took it a step further and said there's no even line of sight limitations, but if you are attempting to target somebody across the battlefield and they are through a piece of terrain or two pieces of terrain or they're next to like they're within cover or adjacent to another piece of terrain then it just stacks the penalties or actually the buffs on their defense so theoretically you could take a shot from one end of the battlefield and hit somebody on the other end of the battlefield um and it's totally fine. I mean, it's super straightforward to do that in the game, but it would be an incredibly epic shot of you're shooting through, you know, two buildings to hit a guy who somehow fails his resistance um, on the other end of the battlefield. So it keeps it simple, but, you know, you don't have to do all the measuring and the, you know, are they in cover, are they not? Is it quarter cover, half cover, whatever? Um, but it's also still represents what it means to have cover and range and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you so think so things like posi things like positioning, cover, they still have their place, but mm -hmm. eff but effective range isn't as mu isn't as much of a thing. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And there are some things like pistols where we limit. Um, where you can pretty much only use them if you're in melee range with somebody and there are some things like flamers where there is a range baked into it but that's the exception not the rule so a flamer might have like a 10 inch range just because it's the nature of that weapon but your all of your standard attacks most of your um a special equipment that you'll equip uh, is just unlimited range but it's then like you said it's the terrain that matters most so it's staying tactical you know hugging the buildings as your units move around using barriers as um, cover as you're kind of moving across the battlefield that type of thing so it does encourage that tactical gameplay mm -hmm. uh, and we, and um, that I think that's I think that's gonna be important because they I get the feeling that for in the way you have things set up, the difference of the the difference in terms of why you'd want to use a pistol as opposed to a shotgun or a sniper rifle has more to do with the adva the advantages or special rules or what have you that those weapons are associated with and not so much the ra not so much the range. Yep. Yep, exactly. So you wouldn't you wouldn't take a weapon, you know, that it has because it has a long range or something. You in fact, in most cases in pen, you don't even take a shotgun, so to speak, in so many words. Like you take a weapon or you add a characteristic that gives your weapon armor piercing, and then you take a weapon or a characteristic that gives your weapon extra damage. Um, and so you kind of build out the profile and you can say, well, this is what it means for my guy to have a shotgun or this is, you know, a laser chain gun or something. Um, again, it's working mostly with the impacts of abilities and then you can skin them and flavor them however you want to. Mm -hmm. The... Now, that, now with that with that in mind... I suppose, I suppose I should have should also ask how you handle um, arc weapons, something like a shotgun or like a um, flamethrower, or even air, even area of effect things like the good old fireball or grenades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, grenades are beneficial in that they let you avoid barriers. So you, if you're trying to target somebody that is a certain, you know, that you're hitting with a grenade, um, they're special one in that it's based on your character's strength stat. So instead of trying to take a weapon that, you know, has a high profile or whatever, it's just, I think it's two times your character's strength profile. So that keeps it really straightforward. You always know, you know, how far it's going to be. And then they're beneficial because they avoid barrier terrain. So you can throw it over things and it'll blow them up and still do damage. Um, things like flamers, they auto hit, so they only do the one damage, but if it's within, I think it's a 10 inch range, then you can auto hit any units that are within that range. So, um, 
uh, again, range becomes a little bit more important there, but those are kind of the exceptions for those specialized uh, weapons. And then for things like fireball in the power side of things, there is a arcing mechanic where depending on the spell, like fireball, it'll say, okay, it does damage to this target, and then it does a lesser amount of damage to any target within like three inches of them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an explosion in, in Warhammer 40k. Mm -hmm. And then if you use like a lightning spell, then it arcs based on if you hit one guy, then you can choose another guy within a certain amount and it'll do damage to him and so yeah. on. Um, so it's just kind of those unique flavor things. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing, but, I'm guessing that in the core, in the full core book, you're going to have a short list of sample weapons to build around um we use we keep the characteristics still we don't like say you know if you take these four or five characteristics then they best represent this weapon um and that's just to keep it flexible for people because if i want um like kind of to go back to these troopers that you were talking about mm -hmm. um if i have the points you know maybe even though it's not as thematic I'll give one set of them full rapid fire that doesn't have a penalty, and I'll give other ones the lesser rapid fire, um, and that just kind of lets you play, play with thematically, but also keep those points in mind as you're trying to build out a special strategy, and kind of building, baking different characteristics into a given profile of like this is a shotgun, this is a um, machine gun, whatever. Um, it can kind of discourage people from playing around with it as flexibly. So at least at the moment, I haven't built out those types of profiles yet. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard date per se, but a general ballpark. So on the Kickstarter, I've told people to expect it by November of this year. Um, the game is, is totally finished. Um, it's fully written. It's pretty fully edited, I, I think, um, as far as I've been able to and as we've gotten back from playtesters. So I've read through it a couple times and done edits, and we've gotten edits back from our playtesters. Um, and I've been getting edits on the demo as well from Kickstarters, just as people are downloading it and reading through it. I have a couple things I missed. Um, so I have it uploaded. Um, well, I guess I have an edition passed uploaded with our supplier and I've ordered a prototype of it and I'm really happy with it. So I'm hoping to put it into production um, in Ju late June, early July and get it to people, backers um, by August or September. Again, giving myself until November, but um, then do a full release, you know, in, in late July or, or August. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess for a window, I'd say anywhere from July to like December, which is a pretty big window, I know, but definitely hoping for more of that July August. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Uh, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> Hey, it's my pleasure. You always ask great questions and really become a, a good voice in the community, asking hard questions for people. So I always enjoy coming on here and it makes me, you know, reconsider some of those design design things. And uh, hey, it's a fun time, man. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> oh, I'm not much of a drinker, but this place is as much madness as I could want, so I'm good. <laughs> and of course, a, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!